This is me, a surgeon for about 30 years, a dinosaur who will describe to you his own demise. So basically, my talk is going to be about what surgery is all about and what interventional technologies will uh, replace it and what will happen soon, what will happen a little later, and what can we do about it. I think it's pretty much simple. Thank you very much. So surgery is actually a, a stupid, mechanical a way of treating sophisticated, complex, physiological and biological problems. And the only, thing, the only reason why we continue to do it is because it works. It actually works very well, uh, but doesn't make a lot of sense, but it does work very well. And uh, surgery actually deals with two kinds of problems. First kind of problem is something like this. So you have a broken bone, you're pro or a stab wound in your heart, or you get shot, you're probably not going to be treated by stem cells. I think it's not going to be fast enough, it'll take too long, maybe it doesn't work so well. So maybe in the, in the foreseeable future, we're going to be treating uh, problems that are organ-based, mechanical problems, with mechanical means. So surgery, orthopedics, all that thing. But most of what we treat today in surgery is not organ problems, but cellular diseases. Uh, basically, infection and cancer. And cellular diseases are diseases of the cellular level, not of the organ. And we are still treating them most of the times on the organ level. Infection was actually what surgeons used to do until about, uh, about 200 years ago. So surgeons 200, 300 years ago, they were doing only, you know, they extracted the rotten teeth, they amputated uh, rotting limbs, they drained abscesses and so on. And only in the past 100 years, they've been treating other diseases, such as uh, cancer. And as if you look at the history of uh, surgery for infectious diseases, you can see that it's slowly going away, because we don't treat soft tissue infections a lot with surgery. We treat them with antibiotics. Uh, we used to treat tuberculosis surgically. We don't anymore. Uh, when I was a resident, gastric adenal cancer, uh, gastric adenal ulcers, uh, were treated surgically. Half the patients in my department were uh, ulcer patients, and this has been found to be actually an infectious disease and being treated with antibiotics. Diverticulitis is going away as a surgical disease, and even in the past few years, we found out that we really don't need to operate on most patients with appendicitis. I know this sounds striking, but you can treat them with antibiotics and they do very well. Cancer is the, probably is going to go through the same route, just will take a little longer. So first of all, we see less cancer. I know this doesn't sound true, but we really see less cancer that needs to be operated on. Uh, first of all, because of prevention. Uh, secondly, because we detect cancer or tumors early, and some of them or many of them can be removed before surgery. Some of them we can treat before surgery via means of directed energy, like drugs or uh, irradiation. And these patients don't need surgery. They're cured by, by means of other uh, modalities. And if you look at the <coughs> charts of uh, cancer incidents, the biggest cancer are really declining. This is stomach cancer over the past 20 years. This is colon cancer. This is lung cancer. This is global. The only cancer with the rising incidence is breast cancer, but the blue line is the death rate from uh, breast cancer, and this is declining because we're getting breast cancer very, very early. So all this will move us from the operating room outside the operating room and from traditional surgical uh, procedures to uh, smaller procedures that will be performed ambulatory. And we will need a lot more technology uh, to do that. So I'll try to take you on the journey to the future of surgery uh, and predict what's going to happen. This is the place to do it. In other places, people will throw stuff at me. So I think in the near future, we'll still be doing invasive procedures, but less and less invasive. So what we're going to see in the next few years is multiple robots and multiple capsules. And the next step, I will I'll talk a little later during my uh, talk. So this is the video of a, a group of uh, researchers from 20 university in the Netherlands and how they see uh, surgery is going to take place in about 20 years. So the surgeon is sitting in this uh, fancy console room away from the patient with a very sophisticated interface that can do a lot of things. Uh, an assistant is putting in an endoscope or a flexible robot into the patient and the surgeon operates the patient remotely using this uh, scope, removing a 
polyp from the patient's GI tract. And then the surgeon turns his attention to uh, the other room. Uh, I'm not going to show you in the entire video, but I'm, I'm going to tell you that he turns the, uh, his chair to the other room, and in the other room there is a suspiciously looking Da Vinci system where he operates with the Da Vinci system on the patient. There, there it goes. And Da Vinci truly revolutionized uh, our look at surgery and, and electromechanical systems, and I'm not going to go and actually jump some of my flies because it was shown extensively in one of the previous talks, but there are a lot of robots coming down the line now. Uh, some of them were recently only uh, research projects in different universities, but some of them are coming soon. These are three companies that are very close to the market with single incision robots, different platforms for single incision surgery. For some reason, they believe that uh, one uh, Band-Aid is much better than three Band-Aids on the abdomen. I'm not sure this is really true for the patients, but it's kind of cool. Uh, but these are still physical manipulations of tissue in the patient's body. Uh, this is probably, this is Mira, a company from Germany, which is probably what is going to come to the market uh, uh, with Medtronic. Uh, and we don't know exactly what will come from these two big giants, but it's going to be here in about uh, two years, and it's going to be probably a big competition to Da Vinci, and I don't know exactly what these robots will do. Uh, this is another solution. This is a company that I'm involved with in Israel, you can see that the right instrument looks exactly like a robotic system. It moves in all directions. It gives you a lot of fancy motion. You can perform a lot of complex procedures with that. But it's not really a robot. It's a handheld robotic system. The company's name is Human Extensions. And it's simply an electromechanical, very smart electromechanical system that allows you to do complex motion with your hand and mimics the tip, mimics exactly what you do with your hand. So it allows you to achieve a lot of what the Vinci system or large systems like that do with a very simple and much cheaper instrument. Because there's a very big gap between a large robotic system and a stupid uh, straight laparoscopic instrument. And we are trying to fill this gap uh, with this uh, device. But the thing is, these are not robotic systems. These are electromechanical systems that mimic exactly what we do with our hands. And robots actually outperform us in every, almost everything they learn to do. They can do much better than we. Uh, this is a very uh, important example of a robotic system beating a person 100% of the times, simply because it's quicker. And uh, in one of the fields, and we are trying to really introduce robots that, are, that have a brain, and the brain does something for us, not only interprets our motion. So if you look at uh, many surgeons who do perform procedures using images, they need a stable image. And we don't have always a stable image, and it really <laughs> bothers us to do our procedures. And what we really need is something like that with our cameras. And here, you can really put a brain of a system to action. So this is a cool Israeli company that makes a robotic system that drives the laparoscopic camera. And the nice thing about it is it has a brain. And it really understands what's going on. It understands the surgical field. It knows where the instruments are and he directs the camera to what the, the surgeon is doing automatically, which is, this is a robot. This is a robot that thinks, that does something using a brain, a brain behind the action, and not only, not only does what the surgeon tells the robot to do. And it provides us with a very stable image. Uh, you can do the operation with one assistant or no assistants, uh, and the, the entire interaction with the robotic system is through a small RF button on your finger. Another field that is coming is uh, pills. So this is the given imaging uh, pill that was uh, used for diagnostic reasons, mostly for a small bowel. But other pills are coming. This is another project coming out of Israel. This is an x-ray pill, a small pill with low radiation x-ray that travels through your colon. You take the pill, you take some contrast media into your mouth, you go home, and the whole process happens when you're about doing your, your things. Uh, the pill broadcasts images to, your, to a transmitter, and, and then it's interpreted offline by your gastroenterologist. So, so actually, for diagnostic reasons, this is cool. Another beautiful project that was uh, funded by the EU, uh, EU and that I was involved with looks into pills that can do more than just travel in your bowel and take pictures. These are pills that, that are either tethered or not, but, and they, but they can also identify 
uh, pathologies automatically mark them or biopsy them. These are all research pro pro projects. They're not still on the market. So the next step after these multiple robots and capsules is what I call the yin-yang revolution. So you know that in Chinese medicine, <coughs> organs are divided into yin organs that are solid organs and yang organs that are hollow organs. And I think what's going to happen to these two groups of organs is that they're going to be treated not surgically or not by conventional surgery. Hollow organs will be treated from within the tube, and solid organs will be treated by ablation and by directed energy. So you know that flexible endoscopy was invented for diagnostic uh, purposes, but uh, with time, uh, it, it was also utilized for therapeutic purposes, first for bleeding and strictures, uh, for removal of polyps and some uh, superficial cancer, and next, I think, it's going to be treating uh, obesity and uh, larger cancers. But if you look for diagnostic reasons, you can have a beautiful uh, CT colonography or MR colonography or a capsule, and you don't really need to stick something into your body just to look into the colon. And there are going to be more and more ways to diagnose your colon without even looking into it. You can use the fecal DNA instead of just blood in your stools. And there are even down the line, I think pretty soon, blood tests that will tell you if you have polyps or cancer by fragmented RNA and DNA from your bloodstream. But this is really cool. This is a picture that was given me by a friend of mine, Yang Wu Kim, who was a surgeon in Seoul that I just met two days ago. And this is a patient with gastric cancer. They do a uh, ultrasound, they see that the cancer is superficial and they remove it completely with endoscopy. And actually in 2015, more cancers in, in Korea, more cancers were removed from the GI tract by endoscopy than by surgery. More than 50% were removed by endoscopy. And you can also treat achalasia, which is a rare syndrome where you have to cut the, the muscles of the esophagus and instead of surgery, you can stick a scope behind the mucosa and cut it and this actually completely replacing surgery. So flexible endoscopy is slowly replacing surgery. The problem with flexible endoscopy is that the tools that we're using were not made for this. They were made for diagnosis. And this is a team of very, very good surgeons from IRCAT from Strasbourg. These are four surgeons trying to remove a gallbladder using a flexible endoscope through a patient's vagina. And this is, it took them four and a half hours. It's really cool. I'm not so sure how useful it is. And the reason is not because they're not skilled, but because the platform is completely inadequate to achieve what they were trying to achieve. So there are some robotic systems that were in the market and then vanished, I'm sure. There are some ways of putting more instruments on current endoscope, but those of you who are involved in development, the market is really ready for a new platform for flexible endoscopy, and it's not there yet. The only system that is sort of like robotized is a system from Singapore, uh, but I don't, I'm not, I don't think it's commercially available, but they've actually operated patients with this system. So this is a system for flexible, robotic flex, flexible endoscopy. So I think most of the surgery is gonna, of hollow organs is going to shift into the tube. Cardiac surgery, it's already happened. It just happened by the cardiologists, not the surgeons. And all the other professions that have hollow tubes that they, they treat will be treated from within. The solid organs will be uh, uh, treated by directed energy. Uh, the term was coined by Rick Satava, who was a friend of mine, was the head of medical uh, in DARPA and is a real genius. Uh, and we can, have, we can use energy in different ways. We can heat tumors with radio frequency or microwave. Uh, we can freeze them, we can focus ultrasound them. And these are examples of uh, liver tumors that are being uh, ablated by radio frequency, lung tumors that is ablated by radio frequency ablation. And actually, there are coming uh, papers showing that uh, if you have a small liver tumor, you're better off uh, ablating it, taking, taking it out surgically. I know a lot of surgeons are mad at me for saying that, but there's real data showing this. And this is uh, even a cooler thing. This is a patient with a small breast tumor fibroadenoma, she comes to her surgeon, she doesn't take her to the operating room, she is in her office, she puts a cryo needle into her breast, she puts an ultrasound probe on top of it, and 10 minutes later, the tumor is gone, the patient goes home, local anesthesia. So you can say, okay, this is a benign tumors, that's not a big deal. So this company, uh, iSense, has done that for fibroadenoma, they completed the study with excellent result, but there's an ongoing study 
on low-risk small breast cancers, and the results currently are as good as surgery. So breast surgery is one of the, one of the professions that is going to go first. And if you follow the literature, you can see it also that you can rule out li uh, uh, axillary lymph nodes using an ultrasound, and then you don't have to biopsy your axilla. And when an ultrasound is turned from a machine to something you can carry in your pocket, and you can do it at point of care, there's no reason for you to do anything else. And I'm sure most women would rather have that than extensive surgery and reconstruction. So we're actually moving away from minimally invasive surgery even further to what I call non-invasive surgery. And a great example of that is a focused ultrasound. So this is patients going into an MRI because MRI can sense temperature very, very well. And a, focused, a directed focused ultrasound is directed into a breast or the uterus and completely eliminates a tumor. And this goes through the skin, doesn't leave any mark, doesn't need uh, uh, anesthesia, doesn't need sedation even sometimes and works fantastically well. So it works for benign tumors, it works for, for bone metastasis today, but there are a lot of studies lo looking at liver metastasis and primary liver tumors with very, very promising results uh, to start with. This can also kill completely prostate surgery, prostate surgery, because you can uh, stick a probe uh, into the rectum. What can you do? And because you're right on the prostate, and you can scan the prostate with an ultrasound and then zap the prostate with an ultrasound. You can see the nerves, you can see the blood vessels, you can see the urethra, you can kill the tumor, and that's it. No anesthesia, no damage, no mutilating surgery. So what we're going to, ha when, what we're going to see is some convergence of surgery in operating rooms and ambulatory interventions happening somewhere else to something that is Together, we can call it image-guided interventions. I think also it will change completely the face of the professions or the guilds of doctors and surgeons and how they work. And I think this will also completely disrupt the medical device market. We're going to see completely different things that will enable all these things. So where should we go from here? I think we should go to flexible and catheter-based uh, therapy, I think we should go extensively, extensively into director energy. I think we need robots that have a brain, not just the arms and the legs, and they should be connected to databases and connected to the cloud, and I think we will need more sophisticated imaging to do all these things. And if you're a doctor or a physician, I think you should embrace technologies and study and publish your results and train and teach as much as you can and be involved physically in the development of new devices, but more than everything, remember your oath and remember that your responsibility is to your patients, and not only to your patients as persons, but to, to the society as a whole, with its resources uh, and with its problems. And if you're not a doctor and you're involved in developing all these technologies, I think you should create new technologies because they will be used, and I think also some of them will not be used. And I will finish with the words of a wise man. Uh, my grandfather, every kick in the butt moves you a step further. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>